Let's discuss the issue of promoter liability. So what is a promoter? Well, a promoter is simply uh, one of the persons behind the business and creation of the entity. So if a client comes to your office and says, I'd like to set up a business and form a corporation, that person is a promoter. Uh, the question we're going to explore is whether a promoter, promoter can be liable for the debts of the business. And here are the two scenarios that might uh, implicate that question, that might give rise to that question. The first one is pre-incorporation transactions. So the client comes to your office and says, let's set up a corporation. But before the secretary has actually filed the articles of incorporation, your promoter starts entering into contracts on behalf of the corporation that has not yet formed. Will the promoter be liable personally for those contracts? The second issue is not defective incorporation. Let's say that the promoter um, files the, uh, submits the articles of incorporation on her own and something happens, they get lost in the mail or she doesn't fill the forms out properly and the Secretary of State rejects them or the Secretary of State is slow in actually filing those articles of incorporation. And in the meantime, the promoter starts running the business of the corporation, which has not really been formed, believing that the corporation has been formed. This is what we call defective incorporation. Will the promoter be liable for those contracts that she entered into on behalf of the corporation that doesn't exist? Um, and the party that entered into those contracts with the promoter um, will that party be able to escape the contract, escape liability under the contract? The idea is that I entered into a contract with a corporation and that corporation didn't exist at that time. Uh, can I escape liability? Can I get out of that contract? All right, first let's talk about pre-incorporation contracts. Uh, remember, you don't have a corporation. Life has not been breathed into this legal entity until the Secretary of State files the Articles of Incorporation, right? Sometimes people misunderstand this and mean that when you submit Articles of Incorporation to the Secretary of State, you have a corporation. That is not so. It's when the Secretary of State actually files the Articles of Incorporation. Now, before incorporation, the promoter might need to enter into contracts. So for example, maybe a great opportunity comes up for the business before the uh, incorporation is complete. The promoter wants to jump on that opportunity and enters into a contract. Usually it's entered into on behalf of the corporation. So the, the promoter signs the contract, of course, with the promoter's name, but saying that they're signing on behalf of the corporation. So here's the idea. The basic law is that you're, if you're an agent and you are representing a non-existent principal, you are entering into a transaction on behalf of a non-existent principal, then you, the agent, you are personally liable under that contract. Right? And that's what we have here. We have a promoter who is acting on behalf of the corporation, who is supposed to be the principal, but the corporation doesn't exist. So the principal doesn't exist. So the agent, the promoter, should be personally liable under that contract. Right? Now, what often happens with these pre-incorporation transactions is that once the corporation is formed, the corporation goes through a formal procedure to adopt the contract. And it's only a board resolution saying, the board now resolves that we will adopt this contract entered into the promoter before the forming of the corporation. So now the corporation adopts the contract. The corporation's adoption of the contract does not relieve the promoter of a liability under the contract. Uh, it, all it does is it makes the corporation now liable under the contract. Will a promoter be liable for the pre-incorporation uh, transactions that she enters into on behalf of the corporation that will be formed? 
it really depends on the intent of the parties, right? If the intent of the contracting parties would be, was that the promoter would not be liable and that the other party, the contracting party, would look solely to the corporation uh, for performance under the contract, then the promoter won't be liable. But that's not often spelled out that way, that clearly in the contract. Sometimes the contract just says something like this. On behalf, the, the, the promoter signs the contract and it's made clear that the promoter is signing on behalf of a, co uh, a corporation to be formed. So now you're a court, you're looking at this and you're trying to interpret the intent of the parties. Um, it's a crapshoot. If you're a lawyer, you're trying to advise your client not just to use language like this because language like this is ambiguous at best. And so you would like to, your client to draft something clearly in the contract that the promoter, your client, will not be liable under this contract and the other party will look solely to the corporation uh, once the corporation is form. Now, that sounds like a great way to draft it, but the other party might not accept that. The other party might say, no, I, I'm not going to rely on the credit of a corporation that hasn't been formed yet. So you have to come up with some creative ways for your client to be able to enter into this transaction before the corporation is formed and still protect your client. All right, let's talk about defective incorporation. So the basic idea is that some steps have been taken to incorporate, but there's been some issue. And so incorporation has not been completed. Maybe the documents have been lost in the mail. And now a lot of things aren't sent by the mail. They're sent through the Secretary of State website. So maybe there was a problem with the website or something like that. Or maybe the lawyer, you, forgot to submit, forgot to do these uh, uh, formalities. And so then you would be liable for malpractice. Or maybe the Secretary of State has rejected the Articles of Incorporation and the promoter didn't anticipate that and thought that it would just be smooth and that the Secretary of State would just file the Articles of Incorporation as a matter of course. For whatever reason, we've gone through some of the steps, but the corporation, the incorporation uh, has not been completed. And then the promoter enters into a contract or transaction with another party. And once again, it's not the promoter, it's the, co the corporation enters into a contract with another party, but we don't have a corporation. So we have uh, our president of the corporation who is president slash promoter, and now that person is entering into a contract on behalf of a corporation and the corporation doesn't exist. Will that person who signed the contract be personally liable? Remember the basic rule is that if you're an agent and you're signing on behalf of a non-existent principal, you're liable. All right. uh, sometimes the issue is not the agent's liability, but the other party will want to escape liability under the contract. So maybe the corporation, quote unquote corporation, has entered into a very favorable contract and now the other party says, wow, I want to get out of this contract. And the other party finds out that the corporation had never been formed. Or the corporation, when uh, the contract was entered into, the corporation had not been formed yet. And the party will say, well, I entered into a contract with a non-existent person and therefore I should be relieved of liability. So there are two doctrines that the courts will use let's not say will use, may use in these situations to resolve these problems for the best interest of the corporation and the agent of the corporation. Uh, one of them is called de facto incorporation and the other is called corporation by estoppel. Let's look at those in turn. All right, let's talk about the doctrine of de facto incorporation. First, let's uh, contrast it with de jure incorporation. De jure meaning by the law. De jure incorporation means you've actually gone through all of the legal steps to become incorporated. You've submitted something to Secretary of State and the Secretary of State has actually filed those articles of incorporation. And so you have a de jure corporation. That's what we call de jure incorporation. De facto incorporation means you've gone through the steps, but 
something has happened along the way and we don't have actual de jure incorporation. So these are the elements of de jure incorporation that there is a valid incorporation statute. It's not really an important element because every state has a valid incorporation statute. Um, that there has been a good faith attempt to comply with the statute. And in our basic fact pattern, we said that um, our promoter has submitted the articles of incorporation to the Secretary of State. So we'll call that a good faith attempt to comply. And then there's been some sort of exercise of corporate authority. Uh, we wouldn't be here if there hadn't been some exercise of corporate authority, right? We're only worried about this because uh, one of the corporations, the quote unquote corporations agents has entered into a contract on behalf of the corporation. And so that would be an exercise of corporate authority. The court might use this doctrine to protect the agent and say, no, the agent is not liable under the contract. Even though we don't have de jure incorporation, we have de facto incorporation and uh, we won't hold the agent personally liable under the contract. Now, sometimes courts call this corporation by estoppel. They just use a different name. And when they apply the doctrine of corporation by estoppel, they use these elements. And so you just have to be able to recognize that this is really the de facto incorporation doctrine. Once again, this doctrine is used to protect the corporation's agent who entered into the contract on behalf of the corporation that had not really been formed. All right, now let's talk about a similar doctrine, corporation by estoppel, right? And once again, sometimes uh, courts will use the term corporation by estoppel when they really mean de facto incorporation. But now I want to talk about the real doctrine of corporation by estoppel. Um, this is where the other party is stopped from denying the existence of the corporation because it only relied on the credit of the corporation. In other words, the other contracting party thought there was a corporation entered into the contract based on the credit of this business, not based on the credit of the agent who is signing on behalf of the business. And therefore, it would be unfair, right? Estoppel is a fairness doctrine. Therefore, it would be unfair to allow that party to sue the agent and recover from the agent when they weren't relying on the credit of the agent. Um, this protects the agent from liability under the contract. It also might prevent the other party from escaping liability under the contract. So for example, if I'm the other party and I've entered into the contract and I discover that there was really no corporation, but I had relied on the credit of the business and not on the credit of the agent who was signing on behalf of the corporation. And now I want to escape the contract and say, oh my gosh, this was a bad contract for me. I want to get out of this contract. The court might apply corporation by estoppel and will prevent me from getting out of this contract. I will still be liable under this contract and I have to perform my uh, uh, obligations under the contract or else I'll be in breach, even though when I entered into the contract, there was no corporation.